What's going on everybody, Teddy Baldassar here, and today we have another Q&A video. I had people submit questions on my Instagram, so today we're gonna be answering those questions. Let's get into it. First question is thoughts on the new Tudor Black Bay 58 Navy Blue. Now, earlier this year, I made a prediction video or watches that I wanted to see video, and one of those was the Tudor Black Bay 58 in blue. So with that in mind, you probably could just assume that I am a big fan of this, which pretty much I am. And I know a lot of people have had some resistance to this. It seemed like a pretty boring pick, it seemed pretty expected, but yeah, I mean, it, it, can you really blame Tudor for doing this? I think personally, it looks really solid. It's nothing crazy. It's nothing that's gonna blow you away, but we've had nothing to be excited about in watches this year for the most part. It's pretty much been a lot of disappointment after the show is being canceled and all that going on. So I think it made a lot of sense for Tudor. It made a lot of sense from a market perspective. And personally, I think it looks great. I think it was a watch that needed to be made. The 58 is such a fan favorite that getting more colorways just makes a lot of sense. I think getting the Pelagos now in a smaller case, as well as maybe seeing some more love for the Black Bay 58 would make a lot of sense as well. But there's a lot of things that Tudor can do, but this was just one I think needed to happen. And personally, I think it looks really great and I could see myself buying one in the future. Next question is why don't companies raise the MSRP prices of their watches when the immediate aftermarket value is more than 200% of the MSRP? I'm thinking about watches like the Patek Philippe Nautilus, for instance. So first one trying to answer this question, could Rolex and Patek say, for example, because I think those are brands that are really, will be in line with what you're kind of getting at here. Could they raise their prices? Yes, and they have raised their prices in certain watches, but could they raise them more? Probably as well. But this is perfect for a luxury brand. This is why they do this is, I think they keep two things in mind. A luxury product to be very, very good and have demand in the market, it has to be scarce. And I think also what they wanna do is develop this perception. If they can keep their supply at a rate, the perfect rate where there is so much demand in the secondary market, think about from a buyer point of view, if you look and how you look at these brands, when you see that huge discrepancy between that MSRP price and the secondary market price. To you, you see that that is an in-demand product. And what that's doing for them is the fact that they know every single watch that they produce, every single watch that just gets out and is available to be purchased is going to sell. And that is an amazing place to be for a luxury brand. It creates scarcity and it creates a perfect grip on supply. And nobody does that better than Patek Philippe, Rolex, and you can probably throw AP in there as well. And another thing here to kind of just consider is they don't wanna overstep, because if they overstep and try to charge too much, then that demand goes away, prices go down, bad for perception. And these brands, for the most part, they've been around for hundreds of years, for some of them, and they don't necessarily need to rush to just make quick money. And a lot of them are private as well. The ones that do very well at this are private, so they don't have to appease shareholders, for example. So I think that's why this all happens. So before getting into this next question, I want to first feature a watch from teddybaldasso.com. So you guys probably are familiar, just updated my new website, and Loom Tech is gonna be the watch that's gonna be showing today Awesome micro brand from my hometown of Cleveland, Ohio. Know the guys behind the brand, awesome guys. Really awesome attention to detail as well with all of their pieces. Looking at the C5, C6, and C7 today, wanted to feature those watches here. Around 500 bucks, great bracelet, 100 meters of water resistance, screw down crown, amazing loom, as you probably would suspect from a brand like this. But other things that I just think are great to have for a micro brand with this attention to detail, they offer free lifetime regulation as well as water sealing with any purchase. And as an authorized dealer, you get that as well from me. So guys, go check out the new website, teddyballstar.com. Have a wide variety of 16 brands, adding more as we speak. And then in addition to that, have a wide variety of straps to choose from as well. And nearly all of the money generated from that website goes right back into the content that I'm creating for free here. So guys, check it out and let's get to the next question. Next question here is, if you could collab with any company to design a watch, what would it be? So if I was gonna pick one brand here, I would probably go with Omega and here's why. For one, I just enjoy the brand. I don't think there's the pretentious attitude affiliated with Omega compared to so many other luxury brands out there, but it does still have that same elevated quality. I think so much that I would just look for in just a luxury watch. So I really just love the brand, but also just from an enthusiast point of view, just probably just reissuing something with a little bit of a modern flair. They have such an expansive back catalog of just amazing pieces that they've just rolled out over the years. And I don't think they're necessarily getting the time of day anymore that I just think would do very, very well in the market. So I would love to be involved in that. Maybe not creating something from scratch, but come on, what watch really is created from scratch nowadays and is completely original, but grabbing some inspiration from their archive, making something new, and there's a lot of potential there. So that would be my choice. Next question here is, what are your thoughts on collectors who only purchase very affordable timepieces? 
So I have no problem with affordable watches. I think it's a great window into the world of this, of this hobby. And also, I don't think you necessarily need to have a world where you have to always buy a luxury watch. I don't think that's necessarily the case because in reality, $300 for a watch in this world that we live in, sure, it might seem affordable, but for anything else. So say you drop 200 bucks on a watch, you're like, hey, it's an affordable watch, there, have fun with it. But you know, if we go to the grocery store and our, our grocery bill is getting close to 200 bucks, we're, you know, we're sweating, man. We're putting it back, you know, hey, we don't need the Himalayan salt anymore. We can put that back. So we're trying to cut corners and pretty much every other aspect. And we don't really think about this logically. The only time that I will say affordable watches can be an issue is when you do have your sights set on a watch that is slightly out of reach, maybe it's a luxury watch, and you just keep going for at that instant gratification of seeing a watch, it's affordable, I can buy it now, I'm gonna buy it. Because that starts to compound and get in the way from what we really want. So don't see an affordable watch as a shortcut, but if all you wanna do is just have variety, collect a lot of different watches, experience a lot of different watches, affordable watches are a great way to get into the world of watches and see that variety. Kind of following along with that previous question, what are some tips that your current self would give yourself when you started collecting watches. So if I was gonna go back and tell myself something about watch collecting, I think what I would probably do, and it was kind of involved in two different elements, but gets to the same point, is just the idea of collecting just for the sake of collecting or thinking that you need to buy a watch just because it checks off a box or say somebody else says that you, you know talked about it in a really positive way. That's speaking to myself right now because it's kind of weird because when I first got into it, I was possibly watching YouTube videos and now I'm the guy that's on the other side of the camera saying this. So I think that's what it would be. It would just be to simply not look so much into trying to check off boxes and just go with the flow. Take your time and don't worry about that. Can your lifestyle actually support it, both financially, but also in terms of, does it actually fit with your attire? Does it fit with your lifestyle? I think both of those elements need to be considered and just have fun with it. This is a marathon, not a sprint. Personal question, watches can be an expensive taste. And personally, my philosophy on that is don't buy if you can't buy it twice. We don't want to have zeros in our accounts, so we indulge in watches smartly. Taking care of your financial stability is important and one aspect that is included in financial stability is investing. So my question is, do you invest? If so, what? Now I saw this question submitted on Instagram and I wanted to answer it for one, one point of view is, I think the elephant in the room so much with watch collecting is how this can be a very addicting hobby and we never want to put ourselves in financial hardship. If a watch purchase ever causes you to lose sleep at night, it is not a good thing. Do not fall into the addiction. I'm in the business of selling watches now and I want people to buy watches because I think that keeps the industry going, it's good, but I never want somebody to be put themselves in a hard or tough situation for buying a watch. That doesn't make any sense. For me personally, what I invest in, I'm now, you know, I'm in business with myself, so I'm of course investing in the business and that might even mean, you know, taking less money, paying myself less money so I can support employees, support, uh, continue to allow the business to grow. That's a big thing for me. So investing short term and seeing that return that you can get from your own business is huge. But in terms of long term investments, I'm a big believer in mutual funds. It's a great way for long term investments, diversification. So usually I'm putting about 15 to 20 percent of my uh, monthly income in towards a mutual fund. So that's typically what I do. Next question is what's more versatile, a light or dark colored dial? So I personally think a light color dial or a white dial is the most versatile dial because I think it does allow it to be a little more playful. I think lighter tones tend to be a little bit more casual, but they never are too casual where you couldn't wear it in a certain situation. Black to me sometimes just seems a little bit more formal. I think of tuxedos, I think of formal black ties. And I don't know if that's necessarily the right idea when you're thinking of black, but I kind of, my head just goes there sometimes. It's not always the case, but if I had to say and lean in one direction, I would say lighter dials typically are a little bit more versatile. This next question here is micro brands. I have an impression that some of the highly desirable brands are trying to duplicate Rolex limited supply strategy to make them even more desirable. What is your view on that? So I do think part of this is building demand for watches, that, that's certainly in the equation, but the reality for, is for a lot of the micro brands and now getting to talk to a lot of the owners of it and just understanding the business side of it, it's very expensive to order inventory of a watch. You know, if you're getting 100 pieces, very well, depending on the retail price, I mean, you're talking tens of thousands of dollars, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it's a lot of capital. So really what I think has been created, and you can kind of see how this works when you're kind of pre-ordering a micro brand watch and you're waiting for it to come in, it's all for helping to fund the production. That's why they're doing it. They're just trying to hit those 
limited production amounts or those minimum requirements of dealing with different manufacturers because they have to buy every single part. They have to buy usually dials, they have to buy hands, they have to get you know cases. Sometimes they can work with directly with one manufacturer to do a lot of this, but chances are they're working with a lot of different manufacturers that can develop parts specialized for what they need. And usually they all have min minimum requirements. So that's usually what's taking place here. Of course, they wanna create demand, but usually that's actually what's happening more than anything else. Frankie's asking here, is it bad to get into the habit of buying and selling watches to keep your collection fresh? I don't think that's a habit. I think it's just a kind of a formality in terms of collecting watches for the most part. If you're flipping crazy, I would start to question what are you buying and why are you continuing to flip? If you're getting very tired of your watches in a quick manner, I think that's not necessarily a good thing. But if you are just trying to just figure out your taste, you're, you're buying things, you're then realizing you're not as much into it, that's just kind of part of the journey of collecting. I have bought a whole collection, I've sold it, I have you know purchased watches and then sold them after I've fallen in love with them because your taste just changed over time. So I don't think it's a bad thing. Just don't do it so much because trying to flip a whole collection over and over again, it does get costly and very just emotionally draining. Now for this question we have, how do you photograph watches so that you get those amazing high quality detail studio shots without any reflections and other things? I'm starting to get into photography more seriously and understand the basics pretty well, but find watches to be very difficult to get good shots of. So I got into cameras around 2016, 2017. And one thing, if I could go back and just tell myself, dude, stop, just stop buying gear so much and just worry about the actual process itself. When you talk about reflections on the dial, I think this goes right into the point that I was gonna say, master lighting. Lighting and exposure is the most important thing. Small angles, understand how light is going to work on a specific product that you're shooting. When it comes to watches, it's a great way to test because and learn just about cameras because it's a small subject that you're dealing with. So you can really start to mess around very, in a big way with making subtle changes with light and it'll allow you to learn a lot more. So what I would recommend is getting a nice soft light source. So getting a soft box, getting a light dome of some sort, or just getting a nice soft light through a diffusion panel. You can get a nice cheap diffusion panel on Amazon for like 40 bucks that you could just throw over any light source and it's gonna make it instantly softer. That is gonna be a great way. Learn a little bit more about exposure. Exposure is gonna be everything for you, but it sounds more like this is just a lighting issue and just understanding how to angle a watch. So mess around, get a nice light source, and that'd be my recommendation. And then after that, then you can look at maybe doing some post-processing as well to help bring that down. But don't fall in love with gear. No gear is gonna get you there. It's really just understanding the fundamental elements. And if you're gonna invest anywhere, invest in lights. So guys, that concludes this Q&A. If you guys have any other takes to the questions that were asked, love to see comments down below. Love been having conversation down there. Also definitely head over to teddyballers.com. Check out those LoomTech watches that I just mentioned earlier in the video, as well as maybe browse around a little bit more and uh, taking a look at different straps and watches that we have available. It's a great way to help support the content and allowing us to keep doing what we're doing here. In addition, definitely subscribe, hit the bell icon, hit the thumbs up if you did like this video. Follow me on Instagram as well to stay up to date with the content. But guys, thank you again so much for watching. Be well. And I will see you all very soon.